I have a lot of clients that, hey, I'm going to use my 401k to buy a rental property. How can I do that as tax efficient as possible? Well, you want to time up the withdrawal of the, the 401k with the purchase of the property so you can net them together. And that's a thing that I don't think a lot of people th talk about that everybody talks about cost segregation and getting the losses, but nobody talks about the other side of it is, hey, what can I do now? All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, I got someone who just flew in from Chicago. He's hosting a big time real estate meetup here in San Diego tonight. He is a big time real estate CPA and now just invested in our boutique hotel fund. I got my man, Ryan Bakey. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Rich. Yeah, man. I, I love your style. You come in, you take action, uh, you're hosting meetups, uh, you're traveling, you're meeting people. Uh, I love it, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been fun. It, uh, like we were talking about, this the heat here is a little different for me. But yeah, I'm enjoying myself in San Diego so far. Have you always been like a action taker? Like, hey, I'm just gonna do this and and quick kind of like this decisive type of personality, or or is that something that kind of happened over time? Yeah. So that's interesting. So there's the quote about, hey, if I had 12 hours to cut down the tree, I'd spend the first 10 sharpening my axe. And mm -hmm. then, but I think you have to know when to take those 10 hours to sharpen your axe and then you also have to know when to just take action so you, yeah. you spend a lot of time you you know what's going on there's there's sometimes there's deals opportunities where you just have to go and take action like here today mm -hmm. and then there's some hey let me sharpen my axe a little bit more before i jump in yeah that's so good dude um i think you can apply that to a lot of aspects of life and business and investing um some decisions you know we think are big decisions but in all reality in two weeks three weeks four weeks down the road you're not going to remember that decision um warren buffett said uh there's only two or three decisions that most people make in their lifetime that actually shape their entire life and so you know for me i can think about those decisions like one of those decisions that has really changed my life was the decision to break up with my former partners and kind of go out on my own and so you know it's, it's really interesting to think about life in that perspective how there's really only a few decisions that you can make that are going to shape your life. Mm. So anyways, man, so tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about what you're doing. You're, you're a real estate investor too. Um, before we get into all the tax stuff, because I have so many questions, man. Um, but like before we get into that, what do you currently own in, on the investment side? Yeah, so I have an accounting and finance degree. That's what I went to school for. I, out of college, I worked at Deloitte Consulting for about two years. So I spent a lot of time with investment management funds, hedge funds, real estate syndications, pretty much helping people who are already rich and wealthy become even more rich and wealthy. Mm. And I decided that I wanted to not help the every, not help every person, but I wanted to help the person in the family that was going to change their family tree. And so I was moonlighting at Deloitte at the time. And that's, and then I ventured off to start my CPA firm and my real estate education company. And here we are now today as an investor, I own seven different assets. So I have a couple of multi, so I have three multifamily, two short-term rentals, and then one RV park, one campground. RV park, man. So yeah. that's, that's an interesting asset class right there. Tell me a little bit about how that came to fruition. It was crazy. Actually, it was a prospect that was going to work at my CPA firm. And she wanted to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. My salesperson couldn't get the deal closed. Mm. So I call her on the way. I was going to, I was actually speaking at SCR Nation last October in Vegas. Uh, in, yeah, it was in Vegas. Uh, Patrick was putting on the conference. So I called her on, on the way there and she goes, oh, I can't really hear you. I'm in I'm in Vegas right now for this conference. And I go, oh, I'm, I'm in Vegas tonight. Mm. Let's cancel this and let's just meet, let's meet up tonight. I got reservations at Mandalay Bay. Fast forward a couple months later, I'm an investor with her, not just her CPA, but I'm also an investor with her. And now I own an RV park. Dude, I love that, man. Yeah. Where, where is that RV park? So that's in Blackhawk, Colorado. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Is lending right now in the RV park space, is it, uh, what is that like? It's always tough. Is it? I think it, it, it's more, it's tougher now than when we got the deal done, you know, eight, nine months ago, but it's very tough. A lot of times they want to see, you know, capital partners, cash partners, people that can, you know, PG the debt. The thing with RVs, mobile homes, they can blow away, right? The bank doesn't want to loan on something that they can't mm -hmm. collateralize. And so if you're going to go down that route, whether it's through SBA, seller financing and raising capital, just know you're probably going to have higher rates and probably less favorable terms. Yeah, absolutely. Spe yeah. Speaking of PGing debt, um, I am PGing, personally guaranteeing a uh, a note on a 130 unit of a hotel that uh, Blake Daly's taken down mm. uh, out in Tennessee. So excited for that. 
Um, but uh, yeah, man. So exciting stuff here, dude. So how did you get into the the accounting stuff? As far as the real estate accounting, I, I was always good at math, but not really calculus and geometry. And somebody told me, hey, if you want to be an accountant, you don't really have to be good at math. You just need to know addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, which is basically what real estate is. You know, it's not complicated numbers. You just have no. to know back of the napkin math. As far as how I got into the real estate CPA thing, I was working at a firm when I was 18 or 19 and I did two tax returns that day. I did one for a, a married couple making 200 grand W-2 income. And I did one for a single guy in Chicago. He had a bunch of apartment buildings. He had about $450,000 of cash flow from his rental buildings. Mm. He paid less in taxes than the married couple that made 200 grand. So not only did he make double their income, but he's also single, so he's in a higher tax bracket. And I asked my boss, and I go, how is this possible? And he goes, it's because he invests in real estate. And ever since then, I've devoted my life to figuring that out on a very complex level. And then through my education and my social media, boiling that down to something that everybody can understand. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you said, you know, it just comes down to math. It back of the napkin math. Uh, real estate investing, you can really teach it to, you know, a seven-year-old kid if you wanted to. It's not that complicated. Um, it's more about just understanding baseline numbers and taking action and being around the right people. Yeah, it reminds me of the videos of Grant Cardone. It's got his, he calls his daughter and asks him to run numbers on a deal. Yeah. I just saw it come up on his page today. Yeah, no, exactly. And um, that's what I love about it. It's like you don't need to um, know chemistry and biology and all this hoopla. Uh, you just have to know how to uh, have the right team. You don't need to be the expert in every single little thing, um, but have the right people wrapped around you and, and you could do a lot of damage. Yeah, and for me, it's really the leaning into the who, not how. Dan Sullivan, that's a great book, by the way. When you're hiring somebody, whether it's employees or VAs or other people delegating tasks, you don't need them to do it as 100% as good as you. If they could just do it as 70% as good as you, that's that's a win in my book. Yeah. For for basic functions. Now, when you're, when you're hiring, you know, social media or expertise, obviously they have to be better than you. But these, you know, when you talk about, I, I talk a lot about the book called Genius Zone, where it's, it's talking about a lot of people only spend 10% of their total time in what's called their genius zone, which is what they're put on this earth to do pretty much. And they spend 90% of the time elsewhere. I'm recreating my life so I could spend 90 to 100% of the time in my genius zone and then nothing elsewhere. I love that. Uh, and the genius zone could be your highest and best use. Is that is that Highest and best use. It doesn't always have to be related to money. Your genius zone could be spending time with your family. But your genius zone, the, the book talks about most people only spend 10% of the time there. Mm. And 90% of the time doing... Busy stuff. Yeah, busy work, admin tasks, stuff that could be delegated, right? So, you know, I don't... Um, I don't shop for my own groceries. I try not to do my own laundry if I can, but some of those things that, you know, the lower ROI tasks, like you said, what's my highest and best use? Yeah. I think exactly the same way. I don't do meal prep. I don't cook. I order Uber Eats like 14 times a week. Not because I don't want to cook, like have a nice cook comfy meal. It's just not the best use of my time. Yeah. And so for me to open the app and click a couple buttons and the food just shows up 30 minutes later, it's like, the convenience factor is is second to none. We just brought on Parker over here, a uh, full time uh, content manager in house, because we were, you know, uh, delegating this stuff out up till now. We had a podcast editor, we had uh, a videographer, and we were kind of outsourcing all this stuff. And so I thought, well, just for a little bit more, we can bring someone in house full time to be nothing but what he's doing now. And dude, it's been great. Mm -hmm. You know, the output. The quality of production, everything is going to be a lot better moving forward, and we can do twice the content now. So super excited for that, but it's a perfect example of what you're alluding to. It's like you know, trying to optimize, trying to leverage, trying to delegate certain things, and just always constantly trying to get a little better. Yep. Yeah, that's the name of the game, man. So all this you know, accounting stuff, people love real estate numbers. How do we save on taxes? It's, it's always a trending topic in the real estate space. A lot of our investors, they invest with us because of the tax advantages. I, I believe real estate's about you know, taxes and debt, right? Um, so what in your estimation in 2023 is the most advantageous thing in terms of a tax perspective to invest in? I mean, it's gotta be, it's gotta be anything with a lot of land improvements. So boutique hotels, RV parks, mobile homes, the, they, on average, the tax benefits are two and a half to three times as good as a single family home or, or a multifamily. I was just explaining the numbers to somebody, the campground that we bought, uh, is two and a half million dollar acquisition price. The the land was 300,000. So we had a total building basis of 2.2. We are just getting our cost segregation study back 
now, and I'm going to do a webinar on it actually, but mm. we're expecting of the 2.2 million in building basis, 1.9 is going to be 100% written off in the first year. That's impressive. 1.9 out of the 2.2, you said? Yes. In, in year one. Yes. And cool. just to give you a perspective, if if we had 2.2 million, say, building bases in a short-term rental, you're, you're talking probably right now maybe six to 700,000. But instead, we're doing 1.9 because all the assets are land improvements, and those can be immediately written off in the first year. So you're saying the more land there is, or is it the more building there is, is what's really going to really give you the depreciation? Is yeah, the, the land? structure that's on the land. The structure that's on the yeah. land. So the RV part, they're, they're counting all the value of these RVs, or how do they do that? That's right, yeah. Really? And, and you guys own the RVs? Yeah. So when we bought it, it was the RV. Most of the RVs were there. We put, we okay. added some uh, RVs or little small, you know, little cabins and stuff. So this is going to sound naive, but I have always pictured an RV park as like people drive their own RVs and park there and they, they rent like a pad. We have both. So we, we have, have we do have pads that people can bring their own or we have ones that people can stay in. What's the difference between like an RV park and a mobile home park? Yeah, mobile home park, most of them now, even though they're called mobile homes, they are going to be stationed to the the ground. They're not they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very similar with depreciation. What you have to be careful for is uh, whether or not they have, you know, concrete poured on them and they're they're sitting on concrete slabs because that can mess with the whether or not you're actually able to write it off 100% because it, the more structure, the more foundation to it, it's probably going to be classified the same way as the building is versus if it's really just sitting on top of the land and it could be really moved at a moment's notice, then it's going to be a land improvement and it's going to be depreciable. With that, you mentioned cost segregation study. Uh, for the listeners that aren't aware, what is a cost segregation study? Yeah. And it really, it really alludes to what you were talking about debt and taxes. And so what I tell, what I tell people is debt, taxes, and inflation. If you mm. can understand those three things, you will be extremely wealthy. What a cost segregation study does is you have to understand normal depreciation. And normal depreciation is how you recoup the cost of the purchase price over the time hold of the investment. So let's say I have a $390,000 short-term rental, just for easy math, 39 years is going to be the depreciable life. So I would get $10,000 of depreciation per year for 39 years until that $390,000 goes down to zero. With the cost segregation, you're able to speed up the depreciation and you're going to be able to take probably roughly, I, I normally say 25% of the building value in the first year. Yeah. So instead of getting 10 grand, I'm going to get you know, I might be getting 80,000 in the first year and debt taxes and inflation, right? I'm able to speed up the tax benefits there, still paying off the debt at the same rate. But inflation is where it really becomes powerful because I got those tax deductions in year one, even if I have to pay the same amount back, say year seven, year eight, when I do sell the asset, because there is the recapture, I just got to borrow that money interest penalty free from the government for eight, 10 years. Even if I paid the same tax going on the way out, I just I just borrow the money for free. Yeah, and if you look at you know inflation over time, uh, you're borrowing money at a uh, cheaper rate than what it would be worth later on. Yeah, um, I love that. Um, so there's a step down, uh, so some step down depreciation changes, right? I believe this is the first year uh, that they're doing 80 percent, next year 60 percent, and so on and so forth. Uh, tell me a little bit about this step down. Yeah. So when they wrote the law, uh, when they when they write tax laws, they try not to make them too permanent. So one of the things was when the tax cuts and job back when Trump came in, was he allowed for bonus depreciation on these assets? So it was it was 100 percent for a few years. And now it goes down to 80, 60, 40, 20 until it what's called sunsets. In my opinion, I've kind of ran some numbers for high for high tax bracket folks. It still makes sense even all the way down to 40 percent. It still makes sense when you look at the the amount of purchase price and their tax rate. But the depreciation is starting to phase out now. There is an extender bill. It's part of the, the bill that actually the House approved of it. Now it's sitting in the Senate that will actually extend bonus depreciation. Really? They're going to throw a bunch of stuff out of the bill, but hopefully hopefully they extend bonus depreciation. Let's say next year is 60% and then they extend the bonus depreciation. Will it go back up to 100 in the following year? They're going to try to make it go back up to 100. They might even retroactive Ooh. date it to this year. That's some gangster stuff right there. That would be big time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, that's one of the, the, the tax advantages of investing in real estate. And you got a bunch of house out there. Uh, what exactly is a 1031 exchange? If you are a busy professional and don't have time to invest in real estate, but still want to participate in the passive income and tax benefits, my team, Summers Capital, is buying a lot of boutique hotels right now. We source the deals. We renovate the properties and we even do all the day-to-day -day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, go to summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. 
Yeah, a 1031 exchange, the best way I explain it is like Monopoly. So when you play Monopoly, mm. well, I would say first thing, what happens when you play Monopoly and you don't buy anything? You lose the game. That's the same thing yeah, in life. You got no assets. If you if you just live life and you don't collect assets, you just take your $200 paycheck when you pass go and you mm -hmm. don't buy any assets, you will lose. And it's the same thing in life. It's, yep. So same with a Monopoly. But in, in Monopoly, you trade up your four green houses for a big red hotel. And that's mm -hmm. what a 1031 exchange is. Is if you have an asset, uh, and it has to be it has to be real estate. If you have a property that's appreciated in value, when you sell it, you normally have to pay a capital gain. And when you swap that for another property, when you trade up in value, you, it typically has to be the same purchase price or a little bit more. Most people trade up, right? Obviously, and as long as you swap that asset for equal or more value, then you can defer the the capital gain tax bill. Yeah, no, that that is good. I've done one in my career. I, we 1031 out of a 32 unit building uh, in uh, Indianapolis that I had with partners. And uh, we set up a tenants in common, a tick. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we were able to 1031 our separate ways. And I 1031 into a uh, luxury property out in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we also have a reverse 1031 exchange. What is a reverse 1031 exchange? Yeah, a reverse 1031 is a little bit more complicated because you have to buy a property first. And the, the hard part about it is where are you getting the money to buy that property without selling the original property? Right. So a reverse exchange is where you buy the, the asset first and then you sell your property afterwards. But very similar, you're still trading up in value. So theoretically speaking, you could buy a property with cash if you had the cash. And then once you close, um, you can sell another property. And as long as I believe the uh, whoever is buying that property is typically going to be held by an intermediary, right? Yeah. And I then yeah. the funds or the proceeds from the sale of your down leg are going to go back to the intermediary. And then theoretically, you, as long as you don't touch the money, yes, right? Yeah. Then it then it will qualify. Is that correct? Yeah. So right now we're in a more so of a buyer's market. For sure. A couple of years ago, it's hard to do a 1031 exchange, especially in the seller's market where you, you have to meet the timelines. And so to be able to identify properties, the property could be sold the next week or under contract. So right now it's a better time to execute a 1031. The problem is, is a lot of deals are not penciling out mm. because people are, you know, maybe they do have the property, it's fully paid off. They have a bunch of equity, but the return that they're getting on the acquire on the new asset just isn't matching you know, it's, it's not worth it to some people. So I'm personally playing that game of, okay, I have a lot of equity here. I don't want to pay a tax bill because it's appreciated in value, but I also don't want to swap my debt. I also don't want to buy a underperforming asset. So a lot of people are just in this standstill. Yeah. It's interesting to see. I mean, right now with this, this rate environment, you know, the fed has all the control rates are very high. Um, but at the same token, we're seeing inventory at an all time low in a lot of markets, uh, around the country. Um, and if you look at the foreclosure rate right now, it's very, very low uh, yeah. relative to what it was in 2009, uh, 2010. Um, and, and so I don't know. It's interesting to see. I mean, I think people right now, they're, they're, they're holding steady. I always say, man, like if you don't have to sell a property right now, it doesn't really make sense to sell. You're not going to get top dollar in the transaction. And I say just write it out. Rates will go back down. They're not going to I don't think they're sustainable long term at this level. Yeah, and I, I typically have, so I do, I call that uh, cash on equity audit, but it's taking, it's looking at the net equity that you have on the property and comparing that to what you project your net income to be. Yeah. So I was just talking to somebody the, the other day, they have a paid off long-term rental property in Phoenix, $400,000 of equity, but they're only making $10,000 a year net income after mortgage payment. That's a two and a half percent return. They would have to rent the property out for 40 years just to break even on what they could walk away with mm -hmm. today. But then the question is, can you find an alternative asset? Can you find a replacement asset? Can you get around the, the tax bill, which is what we help clients do? And you know, navigating all those all those areas. Hey, and now I have to take out debt. I didn't have debt before, and all these things that a lot of times as real estate investors, people all the time will come to me and they'll say, "Oh, I have this question about X," but they have blinders on because they're so focused on that one thing that they don't see. Oh, you actually have a legal issue here. You have a you have a financial issue, or sometimes people have what's called the wherewithal to pay problem. Have you heard about what that? What does that mean? So wherewithal to pay, you know, imagine this. Let's say you bought a let's say you bought a property for three hundred thousand uh, dollars when interest rates were low. Interest rates kind of remain low, but maybe they ticked up. Let's say you refinance it when it was at five hundred k. So you took out let's say you took out a four hundred thousand dollar loan. You bought it for three hundred, took out a loan when it was worth five hundred, took out a four hundred thousand dollar loan when it was worth five hundred. Then you go to sell for seven. 
So a lot of people think like, oh, I'm only going to pay taxes on the net proceeds, but your cost basis was 300,000. Right. And so a lot of times, especially right now when people are going to sell properties, if you're in an extremely high tax bracket, you could be, if you sell out, if you sell it normally, you might not have enough money, net proceeds to cover the tax, uh, the bill. tax bill. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because people always say, oh, cash out refinance is tax free. I'm like, no, never say tax free. It's tax deferred. Tax deferred. Yeah. And that will be recaptured when you go to sell the asset mm -hmm. down the road. But that's where the 1031 comes into play. That's what's key there is if you can properly execute it. Mm -hmm. Right now, can you do it? Yeah. You're going to have a tr trouble finding a, an asset that's going to do well for you yeah but that that's something i always tell investors is you know be like you said it's not tax-free but it's tax deferred because tax deferred a lot of people right now are running into that wherewithal to pay problem and i think if you're gonna if you're gonna buy a deal right now um in this rate environment make sure that you have a low prepayment penalty mm -hmm. or some sort of prepayment penalty that allows you to at least refi let's say two years from now just because i feel like rates will be lower than if i'm a betting man rates will be significantly lower two years from now three years from now than they are today yeah. What happens 12 months from now? I'm not sure. Uh, the Fed just came out uh, today and said they're going to do another quarter basis point rate hike. So I think in 12 months, um, rates could be where they are today or even a little bit higher. I don't know. But I would say in two to three years, they should be lower. Another thing you brought up, uh, return on equity. I love that you brought that up. I think a lot of people don't do a good job of calculating the return on equity. Like you alluded to in that example, your friend was making 10000 a year on a $400,000 paid off property. Well, it's 2.5% return on equity inflation's four and a half five percent right now so uh that's unacceptable to me to be you know mm -hmm. making less than the inflation rate so um you got to reallocate that money put it back to work um you know it's not tremendously hard especially in certain asset classes right now to go get 15 to 20 percent you know what i mean mm -hmm. and one thing i want to talk, talk about there is you talked about you know be really careful when you're combining maybe buying a property in an hoa with dscr loans with cost seg Mm. That's like a Molotov cocktail waiting to happen because you buy a property where they could change the rules and it, let's say it doesn't cash flow as a long-term rental or, mm. or a midterm rental. Okay, now you got to sell it. Well, you got a DSCR loan with a two-year prepay. Now you got to pay, you know, now you got to pay points and you cost segged it. So now you got to pay recapture back. So I always tell people like, be careful stacking. You know, that's like a Molotov cocktail for like failure. Because yeah. if you stack a condo or an HOA in a really bad area with a cost seg benefit with a DSCR prepaid. That's just asking for trouble. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll say this. I, I'm not a big fan of buying condos with HOAs, period. You know, I live here in uh, downtown San Diego and there's a lot of high rise condos everywhere. And I always say, man, you want to own the land to really build long term wealth. You know, you, you buy these these condos here. There's a lot of high rises. One, HOAs typically go up over time. Um, and so as the HOAs go up, there's fewer buyers that are willing to buy your property, which puts a cap on the long-term appreciation. But number two is, you know, with all these high rises in here in downtown San Diego, for example, and a lot of major cities around the country, well, they're building more and more high rises. And so as they do it, they're over flooding supply. So not only is your uh, HOA going to go up, but your appreciation long-term is going to be capped. So for me, I'm like, dude, you got to own the land. Mm -hmm. That said, I do have one property that has an HOA. Um, but it's not in a downtown area. It's a two bed, two bath HOA. It's like 363. But I'm grandfathered in. I operate as a short term rental. And since it's a smaller building, the HOAs probably won't go up too high. And um, I'm grandfathered in. So if they do change the short term rental regulation within the HOA, as long as me as original owner don't approve it, I'm grandfathered in by some act. I reached out to an HOA attorney before I bought it and he verified it. So we'll see. We talked about the reverse 1031. Um, there's a big short-term rental loophole out there, um, that a lot of people aren't aware about, you know, and, and basically if you are a high income earning W2 and you don't qualify for professional real estate status, but you want to, um, get some tax benefits by owning these assets, one loophole is by buying a short-term rental. Can you expand a little bit more about it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, so <laughs> typically if you're a high earning professional and you own real estate, you're not going to be able to use the losses from the re real estate to offset your your income. Mm. Back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth you know, a long time ago, there was uh, no buckets of income, so all all income was the same whether you you know you had regular income or you had real estate income. And so the joke used to be two doctors buy a real estate property together. What do they call it? A tax shelter because mm. they would use they would use the losses to offset their doctor income. So that's what real estate professional status is. Um, and so now if you're if you're a high earning tax nurse, doctor, you can't use the losses from real estate to offset your income. Uh, enter the short term rental loophole where as long as you have an average of seven days or less stay or what I try to tell people is 
it, you can have a 30 day or less stay if you offer personal services. So if you have like a little hotel, then maybe you can do less than 30 days as long as you offer, you know, clean it, maybe a little bed and breakfast type food, you can keep it instead of under seven days, because people always ask me that, you could do under 30 days, add those pers personal services in there, which you're probably doing anyway if you own a hotel. And so under 30 days or seven days or less, and you do what's called material participate, so basically you self-manage it, you can take the losses from the real estate property and, and offset your W-2 income. And we, we have, I mean, probably 150 clients that are you know, hiring doctors, lawyers, I have other CPAs as clients, that are making a ton of money buying short-term rentals, 10%, 15% down home loans in vacation rental market areas and using the losses to offset their income. Uh, in 2022, the average person, high, high tax bracket person was actually getting 40 to 50% of their purchase price funded by the government in the form of tax benefits. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's interesting that you said that, you know, the average guest stay, there is a threshold that's 30 that you can do it. Um, I know with our portfolio, the average guest stay is 2.4 nights mm -hmm. per calendar uh, year. Um, but I'm curious. So with everything that you just said right there, you have to be a, a material participant in this business. So we manage for some third party owners, uh, clients of ours, and um, they they have 100 percent ownership in these short term rentals. But we act as the property manager and we do all the day to day. We market. We do the housekeeping. We basically do everything. And it's hands off for them. Can they still participate in this as a high W-2 uh, earning per person? Most likely not, because they're going to have to prove that they spend more time than you, right? So if you have if you have a property and you have a manager, you have a co-host, you have somebody else that's working in it, you have to prove that you're going to spend more time than them. And what the tax court or the IRS would try to come and say is, well, if you're if you're really truly spending more time than them, well, then why did you hire them in the first place? So it, it's impossible. In my opinion, it's not impossible, but very unlikely that if you have a property manager of sorts, that you can prove material participation in it. Now, if you had six or seven short-term rentals and uh, you had six or seven different property managers and you spent uh, the majority of the time as an asset manager managing all these different property managers, could you argue that that would work? So now you're on to something. So, there, so in one of those material participation tests, there's a, there's a I call it the golden rule. It's a 500 hours across your whole portfolio. Okay. So we have a client that um, he manages five or six properties that are local to him. Mm -hmm. Five or six properties, he manages them. He hits 500 hours in those. You could have as many as you want with whoever property managers. As long as you hit 500 in, in your portfolio that you manage, mm -hmm. you can have... So he has five properties, five or six properties that he manages himself, meets 500 hours. And then he has another six or seven that have property managers. And you can group them all together and take all the losses against your W-2 or business income. So that's the loophole. Pick up more of these short-term rentals and then have other people manage them for you. It's hands-off and you get to participate in the, in the tax benefits. Yep. Yeah. So that's where that grouping election comes into play. As long as you can prove that you're, you're spending some time in real estate, you can, you can group all the other ones that you may not spend time in with your, the ones that you do and take yeah. all the losses against your income. I love that. Because, I mean, as, as, as passive as it, you know, people say it can be, it's still... It still takes time to, uh, you know, review statements, to make decisions, to, you know, basically act as asset manager. When is the best time to sell, refi or buy? It takes time, right? Mm -hmm. Due diligence. And so I love that you mentioned that. Um, what is the Augusta rule? Yeah. So the Augusta rule is where you're able to r rent out your primary residence for 14 days or less to, to anybody. It could also be a business. And so the reason why the rule came is because it's based on Augusta where they hold the, ma uh, the master's golf course. R pretty much there is a lot of people at the master's were running out their property for a tremendous amount of money, like $10,000 for, for one week. And if there's a portion of the tax code that's more favorable for rich people, I don't know about it mm -hmm. because where else are you going to be able to rent out your house for $10,000 a week, you know, unless sure. you live in Augusta. And so a lot of people use it to yeah, either rent out their house, but a lot of people, at least well, the way I use it is I rent out my house for my business. So I can rent out my, for, a, for an event or a gathering. And I don't, I don't go to the full extent of the law, but I'll do, you know, I'll do like one, I'll probably do three or four days of meetings and gatherings at my house, but I'm able to get that income tax-free 14 days or less. And then I get a business deduction for it too. So it's kind of like a double tax because not only do I not claim the income, but I also get to write it off as a business expense. So, uh, you know, for someone like me with, with short-term rentals and stuff like that, would it make the most sense to do the most expensive short-term rental and then do that? You said 
Well, it has to be your primary residence. Remember? It has to be a primary. Yeah. Ah, I see yeah. what you're saying. Okay. It has to be a primary. And is there any cap to what you can rent it for? I mean, why can't you just say yeah, I mean, 60000 for a week? I, uh, I always try to tell people the, what, what would the fair market pay for it? Mm -hmm. So uh, similar to uh, hiring your kid for your business, I always say, what would you pay the neighbor's kid to do the work? Mm -hmm. It's very similar. You would look at what comps are in the area. You know, I'm not going to be able to rent my house for $1,000 a night, but yeah. you know, I might be able to get $200, $250 a night. What are some other major, any other major changes in the, uh, the tax code right now? or anything pending that uh, that people should be aware of. Hey guys, real quick, the only way this podcast grows is if you guys share it and review the show. So if you do find value, if you could take two seconds and drop a five star on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world to me. But more importantly, it will help us reach new audiences and help more people build wealth through real estate investing. Yeah, I mean, there was actually a recently a thing, not really real estate related, but I get this question a lot with wealthier clients that have investments for children. Uh, they just passed a law that allows you to roll over 529 funds into a Roth IRA after 15 years. So a 529 plan is basically an education plan for children to go to college or trade school, or you could even pay uh, some other expenses with it too now. But before, you know, hey, I have this 529 for a kid and the kid doesn't end up going to college. Like, what, what can I do with it? Mm -hmm. There's only so many things you can do with it. Well, now you can actually roll it to a Roth IRA. And the reason why the Roth IRA is super powerful is because think about this. With a Roth IRA, you can actually uh, take out up to $10,000 of earnings tax-free if it's used for a primary residence for your first time home. So with this sort of thing here, let's say I'm funding a 529 for my child, they don't end up going to college. I could roll that to a Roth IRA and now the child can take out pretty much all that money plus $10,000 of earnings to buy their first primary residence that could be a house hack. So I really like it as, hey, they're not using the money for college, Let's go ahead and roll it to a Roth IRA. Let's let them buy their first real estate property completely tax-free because you got a tax deduction for it. And then you don't have to pay taxes when you take it out because it's a Roth IRA. I love that, man. That's a, a very interesting and unique strategy. Is the $10,000 out of this, the Roth to purchase your first primary, is that, a, is that a relatively new thing? No, that's been a, around for a while. It's been around for a while. So another strategy that we implement for a lot of clients too is paying your children out of your business. So in that one, you get a triple tax deduction there because number one, you get a d deduction from your from your business to your child. And so you're able to write off, let's say I'm in a 37% tax bracket, I'm able to cut my 37% uh, savings on the dollar, right? Because I pay them under what's called the standard deduction, it's like $13,000 this year, then they don't have to claim it as income either. And then the best part is now that they, now they can use that money to fund a Roth IRA. Because mm. you have to have earned income to, in order to fund a Roth IRA. And why we love that Roth IRA is because you can you can withdraw up to ten thousand dollars of earnings plus your original contributions completely tax free if it's for a first time home, also if it's for medical expenses or education expenses. So picture this: you have a kid, let's say fourteen, fifteen. You put them on payroll. Now they're twenty, twenty one, twenty two. They're ready to they're ready to buy a house. They withdraw that whole account for for a property that could also be a rental property if they do a FHA owner occupied loan. Right. Wow. And all of it was done tax free. And it's it, you're just transferring wealth from you to your child. It's staying in the family, but you pretty much bought a rental property with, with nothing. Is there a cap to how many kids you can hire? No, there's not. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. I've never been asked that before, but yeah, that's interesting. What about like other family members? Does it make sense to hire? So that's an income shifting strategy in general. You know, if I have a, if I have a, a mom or a dad that doesn't have any income, I'm shifting income from my super high tax bracket down to theirs, where if they're not making any money, then they're not going to have to pay taxes on it, right? So I'm just getting like a phantom expense on my end. They don't have to pick it up as income. Mm. What's the number one tax question that you get from clients? Man, I have to think about that. I guess the it's, it's always about, can I use the losses against my income? Because mm. it's a super powerful strategy because you're creating their paper losses, right? They're not cash flow losses. It's like I just made, you know, on one deal... I made fifty thousand dollars of rental income, but I showed a hundred and eighty thousand dollar tax loss, right? That I'm able to use to offset my W two. So if I'm paying thirty seven percent, let's just round it up to forty, and I got a hundred eighty thousand dollar loss, like I just saved seventy two thousand dollars in taxes. Yeah, I mean they say taxes will be like the biggest expense that one will oh, pay in their lifetime. Hundred percent. Right? Yeah, every um, single person shares the same common trait that they paid. The taxes is their number one expense. Yeah. I mean, between property taxes, income taxes, sales tax, and some states have all three, right? Yeah. I mean, here in the uh, beautiful state of California, I believe we have all three property tax, sales tax, income tax. 
Uh, a lot of states have two of the three. California would tax the air that you breathe if they could. <laughs> Dude, yeah. They would. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. But love it out here. What are some other loopholes that we didn't cover? Man, I mean, there's depending on who you are and kind of what you do for work or what, what your objectives are, there's, there's, there's a ton of, if we're talking real estate specific loopholes, there's, we talked about 1031s, we talked about, I love the idea of using the losses. So it's, it's one thing to have these losses, maybe get a big tax refund, right? But then it's another thing to, okay, now that we've lowered our tax bracket a lot, what are some other things that we can do, like convert money from traditional over to Roth mm -hmm. and save a bunch of money in taxes? Or I have a lot of clients that, hey, I'm going to use my 401k to buy a rental property. How can I do that as tax efficient as possible? Well, you want to time up the withdrawal of the, the 401k with the purchase of the property so you can net them together. And that's a thing that I don't think a lot of people th talk about that everybody talks about cost segregation and getting the losses, but nobody talks about the other side of it is, hey, what can I do now? So we had a client that she was a lawyer making half a million dollars a year, bought a bunch of rental properties. And now next thing you know, her taxable income is negative 80,000 for the mm -hmm. year. So she was able to, it's like, okay, what can we do with that? Okay, let's get, you, let's, let's convert $80,000 from traditional to Roth. So you don't pay any taxes on that 80,000 for the rest of your life. And now that we're at zero, well, the capital gains, the way the capital gains tax brackets works, if people don't know, is capital gains are always going to be taxed a lot less than earned income. The most you'll pay on capital gains is 20% compared to earned income is 37. And so if you're married and you make nothing other than capital gains, you can harvest $120,000 of capital gains completely tax free. And so, okay, we just converted $80,000 of traditional over to Roth, paid nothing on taxes. And then we, then we pulled $120,000 of gains out of her brokerage account completely tax-free. And that's gain. That's not the principal, right? So pulled out 120000 to then fund the next investment property, which mm. repeats, rinse and repeat. And that's, that's, that, that's another loophole that you, know, you brought up. And I think um, it's a strong play. I mean, if you're going to do a, a 401k withdrawal, right, and you're going to have to pay taxes in that given year, uh, you can go out and buy another property. If it's a short-term rental property, maybe that's another way to uh, utilize that. I do have a question for you. So if you uh, don't qualify for professional real estate status, but you make less than like, what is the threshold, like 150 a year, can you still qualify as long as you're a material participant? Short-term rentals with material participation, there is no income limit or cap. Right. So I could be making 100K or I could be making a million. Short-term rental still, side, yeah. let's just say it's the long-term. If it's on the long-term rental side, if you make more than $100,000 a year, it starts to get phased out until if you make more than 150 then you don't get to take any losses from long-term rentals against your income. There is the, what you're referring to, we call it the mom and pop exception, where it, if you're an active participant in the in the real estate, so this is actually how I bought my first property. Okay. So story time. So Let's hear it. my first property I bought, had it under contract for 240, it appraised for 260. Okay. I go to the seller and I say, hey, I'm gonna bump the purchase price up to 250, or 260, because mm -hmm. the bank will appraise it. And you took a credit. But I'm gonna need a credit towards my closing costs. And so I got my, because it was 3.5% down at 250, uh, 250, I basically got all my down, you know, all closing cost down payment funded, no cash out of pocket. And then I did a cost segregation study on the top of the duplex. And because I, at the time, your boy was only making less than $100,000 a year, I was able to take a $25,000 loss against my income. I saved $6,600 in taxes. So I pretty much got paid $6,000 to buy my first investment property. I love that. And so that answers my question right there. So if you buy a long-term property and let's say you self-manage your long-term property, and you make less than $100,000, you can utilize the depreciation from that property to offset your W-2 income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and if you're, and it's not, it's not, if you're, I didn't know that. If you're I single, if you're single making 85, 90 K you're, you're still in a federal 22% bracket. And if you got state taxes, you, you know, I was saving 27% on the dollar of that. So that's how I kind of got to save 6000 that year. So, I mean, for anyone out there that's making, let's say, 80 k go buy a primary residence on a zero money down loan. Uh, there's plenty of credit unions out there that will do no money down or even FHA 3.5% down. Go live in the property for a little bit, turn it into a rental, and get a cost segregation study. And then now you can utilize that depreciation to offset all of your income taxes probably for the next three, four, five years. Yeah, and you know, to get a six thousand dollar check when you make eighty, that's a big, that's a big uh, one hundred percent. Yeah, and if you bought a, let's say you live in San Diego, you bought an eight hundred thousand dollar home for zero money down, 
Um, and then you can potentially depreciate, you know, let's say 200 grand of that. That's a lot of uh, years of no income taxes. Mm -hmm. Dude, I didn't realize. I, I've never looked into it, right? Um, I knew the 150K threshold, but I just never looked into that that bottom end right there. I'm like, I didn't know that's a thing. That's that's pretty unique. You're talking to somebody that did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. Dude, that's cool, yeah. man. That's cool. Well, tell me a little bit more about uh, the 401k system. I, you know, I'm, I've always been curious. I have my beliefs in the 401. I got my jump start in real estate investing uh, through a 401k. I was always taught from a young age to go to school, get good grades, go to college, get a job, diversify, invest in your 401k, play it safe. And that's what I did. And so I built up this 401k for 11 years. I used to be a federal employee um, for the FAA as an air traffic controller. So I built up this 401k and it works, but it doesn't like really like get you rich, right? It doesn't like really go up over time, like significantly. And so um, I ended up getting into real estate investing and I cashed out my 401k to kind of get my start. And there's a lot of different hoopla's and stuff that, that I believe in, in regards to the 401k, but I've never asked someone that is a, you know, a, a real estate tax accountant, what their perspective is on the 401k. Yeah. Overall, I think society and the school system, education system teaches people to play it safe. You know, mm -hmm. don't, you know, you're in this little box, you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be an accountant, you're going to be a welder, and they put you in this little box and say, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Yes. And it takes somebody like you and I to knock and tap on that and say, why are things the way that they need to be? Like, why can't I do this or that? And why does it have to be? And so if I think the 401ks are fine if you're somebody that lives life in that box. Mm. Every single step of the way, if people are listening to this podcast and they're either in real estate or they're trying to get in, they probably had somebody say, what if? What if it doesn't go right? What if the toy, you know, toilet backs up and you're not there to fix it? There's so many people in life that are going to tell you what if, but there's nobody in your life that's going to tell you what if it could be better than you ever imagined. And mm. that's what it was for me. Getting into real estate investing, quitting, quitting Deloitte at 23 to go work full time for myself. There's nobody, nobody's going to tell you what if it could be better than you ever could imagine. And so I think the 401k is fine if you're living in that box. But for people like us, we like not to use 401ks. My personal, what I do is I have a, so I used a, what's called a, a time value money calculator to figure out, okay, if I'm turning retirement age, how much do I need in there? Okay, it's 5 million. How much do I have to invest per month to hit that amount and like that safe amount? Right. But I'm going to deposit my net disposable income above that amount into real estate or other businesses. So it's fine if people want to play it safe, but I think it really is. And not to mention the government, when COVID happened, they, they robbed a lot of people because they allowed you to withdraw your money out of your 401k without the penalty. And they allow you to defer the income tax a little bit, but they, they robbed so many people because you withdraw it at its lowest peak because the stock market took a 30% hit. And now it's, it's literally back up to what it was, you know, mm -hmm. pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to be the 401ks or a scam type of guy, but it, it is, it has its purpose. It's for the person that lives in that box. I mean, it's been around since the uh, 1980s. And if you actually look at the average 401k balance, not the average, I'm sorry, the median 401k balance for all these different age groups, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it's a flawed system. Yeah. Right. I think it's better than doing nothing. Um, but those balances aren't really anything that you can live on especially if you no. live in an area like like California. And actually that's uh, with a client of ours, she had um, a little over 400 in a 401k. Yeah. And, you know, 4% withdrawal rule, she's only making 20 grand a year. Yeah. But we were able to get her out of the uh And you got to pay taxes on the 20,000. Yeah. Right. Right. So we were able to get her out, take her 400k out. Of course, she bought some short-term rentals, was able to offset the income tax bill. And now instead of making 20 grand a year, she's generating 120 to 150 grand in net rental income per year. You know, and coming from a real estate CPA, uh, you are giving the people the green light to cash it out and invest in the real estate. Yeah. And look at that. So that's crazy. It's my dream job was to be a motivational speaker. Like okay. and the CPA was just a backup. Plan. You're, you're motivating me right now, man. But yeah, but I, I get to be motivating in the subject matter expertise that I have. Okay. So it's, it's, it's really cool to kind of see it all come together. Now, if you want to talk about a scam, that's the social security system. That's the biggest scam on mm. earth. That's a Ponzi scheme. Well, real, real quick, before, before <laughs> we move on to the social security system, and I, and I do want to touch on that, you know, with the 401k, I always thought it was odd how, you know, you can't touch your money till age 59 and a half. Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that's a slice of your hard earned time and income that you're never going to get back. Imagine depositing money into a bank or a credit union checking account, and then you going into the bank one day and saying, hey, I want to do a withdrawal and access my money. And them saying, hey, 
we are in control of your money to age 59 and a half. We are going to invest your money. We're going to make a spread on it, but you can't access it for 30 years. Mm. Think about that. Like, how is that even legal? Well, it's the government's way of making money, right? Because they're yeah. going to tax you on it either way. And then to take it a step further, I believe at age like 71 or age 72 and a half, if you don't start withdrawing your money, uh, they're going to start penalizing you for not withdrawing it because they know that you are close to dying and they need you to pay your income taxes on that money before you die. Yeah, because they want to get you before you die and then it goes through probate yeah. and it goes through. Dude, it's all yeah. system, man. Yeah. I think the 401k was built for Wall Street and mm -hmm. maybe the government. Is that far fetched? Well, the 401k was uh, pretty much to bail out these companies for not having to do a pension. You know, pensions were the big thing. And then, you know, they did away with pensions because it was very, very bad. Sometimes people's pensions blew up, right? They were underfunded, they didn't get the money. So then, they, you know, open up the 401k for companies to pretty much shift the responsibility, the burden onto the employee rather than the employer. Mm. Okay. So tell me about the, the social security system. Why is that flawed? Oh man. So if you're a W2 employee, go look at your recent pay stub. You'll see a little thing that says social security, maybe SOC for short. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see a thing that says Medicare. So that typically, if you're a W2 employee, that makes up 7.65% of your earnings, mm. of your earnings. It's just, it just goes away to the government. And a lot of people don't see it because they only see the net. Oh, that's my check. They don't look at their pay stuff. I mean, you know, I have clients that make half a million dollars, million dollars a year that don't even know that they have money going away to Social Security. Don't even know what SOC. What's that stand for? But it's it's money that's going to Social Security, Medicare, which you know funds older people and people that are sick. It's okay, but yeah, that's that's a, and they they hold on to seven point six five percent every single year up to a certain amount. What's the cap now? Because I think the cap used to be around like one sixty. I want to say it's no, it's a little. 162 or was it maybe? no it was like it used to be like 110 it used to be very yeah it gets indexed for inflation okay but your first you know 7.65 percent on your first 160 let's call it that money you don't get to your 63 right if if you even get if to you see get it. it we don't know if we're gonna get it yeah and and it's even worse if you're self-employed because if you're self-employed you have to pay 15.3 percent up to the same cap up to the same cap so a lot of people think Oh, I'm gonna go from W two to self employed. Like, yeah, I'm gonna crush it. But you're gonna pay more on Social Security taxes. Yeah. Insert because the, as a W two, your employer is paying yes, the other the other proportion. Right? Yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're 1099 or your W two going to be a self employed 1099, look into what's called an S corporation. Uh, I'll plug. I have a podcast, Learn Like a CPA show. Did a whole episode on it. But yeah, Social Security, Medicare tax. If we're gonna paint a picture, that's that's the bully right there. Yeah. So tell me about the benefits of operating under an S corp here at Summers Capital. We uh, operate as an S corp. Um, we're an LLC, but we file as an S corp, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what are some of the benefits of that? Yeah. So if, let's say I'm self-employed. I'm making a hundred grand a year outside of federal and state tax. I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay fifteen thousand of that to Social Security and Medicare. It's going to be a fifteen point three percent, and it's flat. It's not even indexed. It's just flat. Fifteen point three percent of a hundred grand is fifteen grand. Let's call it. Uh, that's what I'm going to pay to the government, right? Social Security, Medicare. Now. If I operate as an S corp, let's say I take a W two of forty grand, and, I, and the sixty thousand becomes a distribution. That sixty thousand isn't taxed with Social Security, and Medicare. So on a hundred thousand dollars of income, if I'm set up as an S corporation, I'm saving nine thousand dollars a year in taxes mm. just by just by a little tax election and following a return. So a lot of people, you know, sub. I I operate as an S corp with my with my CPA firm. I mean, you know, I probably save five figures a year in taxes yeah. just just by being an S corporation. A lot of uh, my investors, uh, this is a, a question that comes up sometimes. And I'm curious your thoughts on it. Um, the ones that are investing into our fund uh, with through their personal name, sometimes will ask, well, is there any benefits of creating an entity and investing to the entity? And I can't think of any benefits other than they're going to have the cost of forming the entity and paying the annual tax. So I always say, hey, you know, unless you're going to do multiple investments, I say just just do it on your personal and you can always switch it up later. If you end up creating an entity, just let us know and we can, we can switch it out. In your estimation, is that the right response? Is it accurate? Is there any benefits that I'm overlooking? Yeah, I think from a tax perspective, you're talking if you're if it's either in your personal name or a single member LLC, well, mm -hmm. either way, it's still going to flow and hit your personal tax return. Mm -hmm. From a tax perspective, I don't think there's any, there's not an incentive to hold the investment with, a, with an LLC. Now, from a legal perspective, there might be because you you don't want that. You may not want a deal attached to your, your personal name. Yeah. Now, if you're an LP, there's a limited partner, stands for limited risk. Right. But there's not there's not a tax incentive to have a holding company. You might you might do it if you're a part of a bigger syndication or fund. You don't want to give your social security number away. So you right. set up a single member LLC. So now you have an EIN. But from a tax perspective, it doesn't matter if you're 
if it's in your personal or if it's in your uh, single member LLC. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of overlap between you know CPA accounting advice and then legal advice, right? A lot of overlap there, but so much good stuff, especially how it pertains to real estate investing. I want to pivot a little bit. Um, you know, so you're investing in short-term rentals, campgrounds, RV parks. What are you most excited for? You know, as you look forward uh, in 2023 in terms of your own personal investments. I'm really excited about the opportunity that's coming up in the next five years. You have so many mom and pop owners that are burnt out, ready to get out of business. They're not really rich. All they have is that business, that RV park, that campground, that car wash, whatever it is. And they'll probably sell or finance it to you mm -hmm. because they don't have a son or daughter that's going to take it over. They can't find anybody that's going to buy it from them. Insert you, right? Insert an operator, somebody that's hungry. Um, you can get seller financing, you can get SBA loans, you can raise money for these deals. I'm really excited for the opportunity. And, you know, coming up, there's some three to four million small businesses are expected to change hands over the next five years. And I think they define a small business as anyone that's under 2.5 million in revenue. Is that what it is? You know, there's SBA, then there's the government. So it's, it's different from who you hear, but it, there's a lot of opportunity and especially like in the trade businesses. I mean, nobody wants to be like a welder or a plumber nowadays, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but somebody's got to own these companies. Somebody's got to do it. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for people to get into business. And, and nobody right now wants to, you know, nobody wants to work for somebody. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur or owner or something. And um, it, it, it's going to be a lot from the CPA financial side. You have so many financial planners, CPAs that are retiring. There's not enough people that are coming in that are taking that risk or that chance. And so there's just a huge opportunity, I think, for entrepreneurship over the next three to five years in general that I'm excited about. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's just so many baby boomers out there that are retiring the mom and pop type of owners, um, not just small business, but, um, you know, real estate too. Yeah. I think, um, a lot of boutique hotel owners that we're targeting are that mom and pop. They kind of fall into that category. Um, not necessarily the most savvy, but they've, you know, figured out a way to make it work. And now, um, they're selling their underperforming business. And now it gives opportunity for people like you and I to come in, um, and create a lift through renovations, good marketing, good operations and really force our, our value add that way. So excited for the opportunity um, as we look forward in 2023 as well, man. You know you're gonna get a deal when the owner has an AOL email. What? Is, oh, wow. Cause Dot that's AOL. how you know outdated they are. Yeah. yeah, if they have an AOL or like whatever the older uh, mm -hmm. handles are. But this particular uh, campground that we bought, uh, owner had an AOL, so I already knew there was opportunity right there. <laughs> They're definitely outdated. You go on their website, they do all the bookings over the phone. Mm. Pen and paper over the phone bookings. We implemented direct booking. Got our guests retarget guests through ads. You know, capture their email, retarget them, give them discounts, give them pro promotions and stuff. Just a new way of doing it. And I think everything's going to get better when people who are have been doing it for a while but not doing it efficiently turn it over to people that ha are doing it efficiently and th that are hungry. Yeah, I completely agree, man. Marketing is is huge out there. Um, like the hotel that we bought up north. Uh, we bought it for 1.53 back in uh, August of last year. It just appraised for four million, but that owner had owned it for almost 20 years, and and this guy was just utilizing a direct booking site and nothing else. And so just by us going in there and turning on, you know, marketing on Airbnb and Verbo and all these other OTA platforms, um, we were able to just drive a lot of revenue by doing that. And that that change doesn't really cost us anything from like a capex standpoint, you know. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there, man. So excited for it. Well, brother, I appreciate you coming coming on the show, man, and taking the time, dude. Super inspiring to just, you know, hear all your stuff that you're doing and um, looking forward to like continuing to follow your journey in, in this meetup tonight. Yeah. They, thanks so much. And yeah, everybody, if you want to get in touch, just learn like a CPA on all social media platforms. Also got a Facebook group, Tax Strategies for Real Estate Investors. We have about 7,000 real estate investors in there talking tax strategy daily. Love it, man. We're, uh, I know some of the team and I, we're going to go hit your meetup tonight here in San Diego. But uh, like you said, follow my man on Instagram at learn like a CPA. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.